Welcome back to Cosmic Comics. Last episode, we took an in-depth look at the multiverse. I thought this episode would focus on interdimensional beings within the Marvel Universe, but there seem to be fewer of those than I remember, so instead it'll focus more on other dimensions and what we find there. This episode might as well be called where in the multiverse is Dr. Stephen Strange? As he seems to have paid a visit to nearly all of the places I'll be mentioning today. The easiest place to start this is to continue with the Book of Ashanti from Dr. Strange, Sorcerer Supreme, issues number 21 through 22, where we're given an in-depth explanation of both the Dark Dimension and the Faultine. We learned in the previous episode that the dimensions within the Marvel Universe can have more or less than three spatial dimensions, and even portions of a spatial dimension. These universes are extremely different from our own, but life can still be found there. One such dimension is the Dark Dimension, which exists on a higher plane than Earth, as it has more than three dimensions. We're told that the gravitational forces between two bodies here decrease rapidly with distance, making celestial orbits unstable and stars incapable of forming. Additionally, electrical forces are non-existent due to electrons either not adhering to atoms or spiraling into the nucleus. For these two reasons, a lack of stars or electrical energy is why it has garnered the name the Dark Dimension. Light within this dimension is a variable phenomenon subject only to local conditions. Since gravity itself is weaker here, space itself is more porous, leading to an abundance of charged vacuum embodiments known as warps, which in turn leads to a myriad of pocket universes. As covered in the previous episode, pocket dimensions, also known as pocket universes, are dependent upon a host universe to be attached to. Remove the host universe and the pockets go with it. Within the dark dimension, life found a way. In fact, Due to the unstable nature of the Dark Dimension and its numerous pocket universes, life found a way over and over and over again, taking on many forms. In one of the pocket dimensions, a species known as the Mindless Ones were born. Despite a lack of light under most circumstances, some beings eventually learn to harness mystic energies that they use to create light and stabilize gravity. These beings who brought light and order into the Dark Chaos were given the name Muruks, a term that means wizards. The Muruks gave birth to the first civilization within the Dark Dimension, and upon the road to enlightenment, wars were fought and cities rose and fell. Through the passage of time, empires eventually took hold. The greatest of these was the Guaranthic Empire, led by Guaran the Great, who sat upon the Azure Throne and created the Guaranthic Guardian. Time passed, and more wars were fought, but the Gururanthic Empire persevered and the Azure Throne remained. One of Guran's descendants, Oka'an, united normal people and the Muruks into lasting peace that led to a golden age of 28,000 Earth years. But all good things must come to an end. The wizard king Olnar wanted to resurrect ancient glories. What those ancient glories might be is never explained. Needless to say, Many Muruks saw this as a bad idea. I'll come back to Ulnar in a moment, but first let's take a look at a dimension of a higher order than the Dark Dimension. As we move further and further away from Earth's place in the multiverse, things become more and more strange. We're told that the Faultine is a very old, very dense universe, with even more dimensions than that of the Dark Dimension. In the Faultine, there is no matter, only energy. Even here we find life and are told that to a Faltinian, the difference between a quark and a gluon matter as much as the difference between lead and gold to those of Earth. The Faltine is inhabited by energy creatures that would be considered by the average Earthling extremely powerful. Tiny variations in energy entering into one of their bodies could become the subject of feuds that would last millennia. Upon being filled with certain combinations of energies, Faltinians give birth to a scion who is a smaller replica of their genitor or parent. The scion is devoted to the genitor. The goal of every Faltinian is to gather more and more of the best energies they can find and to increase the size of their clan. In a rare exception, a Faltinian named Sinifer gave birth not to one, but to two scions, both of whom were different from their genitor. 
This had never happened before, and the reason behind this deviation is unknown. These scions went by the names Dormammu and Umar. They differed from other Faltiniers in that in a world full of energy, they both lusted for matter and soon began gathering matter to themselves in the same manner that other Faltiniers gathered energy. When Cynifer tried to put a stop to this behavior, they transmuted their genitor into dark, dead matter. A crime of this magnitude was almost beyond the scope of comprehension for most Faltiniers. The Faltiniers as a whole united and banished these two from their universe. The two siblings then took off towards the lower universes, where they found plenty of physical matter in which to feed their lustful appetite. Upon discovering the dark dimension, they decided it would suit their needs and each assumed a humanoid form before meeting up with King Olnar. Upon meeting with Olnar, they explained that they were fugitives of the Faltine, but if he would agree to give them refuge, they would show him how to expand his boundaries and power. Once he offered them sanctuary, Dormammu and Umar then showed Olnar how to travel the multiverse and to absorb other universes into his own. Such empire building didn't set well with all of Olnar's people. With the help of Umar and Dormammu, Olnar attempted to take over the pocket dimension of the Mindless Ones. This was Olnar's undoing. The Mindless Ones knew nothing but destruction, and once unleashed upon the rest of the Dark Dimension, they killed many, including Olnar. Dormammu and Umar used this opportunity to kill almost all of the Muruks. The remainder were exiled to the outer fringes of their world. The twins then erected the Great Mystic Barrier, which held the Mindless Ones to a pocket dimension behind it once more. This had the effect that the two of them were hoping for, and the people of the Dark Dimension celebrated the twins and elected them to be their regents. We're not told how, but Umar's power had been weakened in the struggle, and thus her brother took a more dominant role in the leadership. Now, securely in power, Dormammu partially reverted back to his Faltine form, while at the same time magically merging himself with the Dark Dimension's mystical energy. He then decreed that the flames of regency would appear above the head of whoever was destined to rule the Dark Dimension. After consolidating their powers within the Dark Dimension, Dormammu and Umar expanded their reach into nearby universes, waging war and making treaties with other neighboring dimensional warlords. All the while, King Olnar's son, Orini, grew up before their eyes, never seen as a threat to the two twins. Over time, he attracted the eye of Umar, who used honeyed lies to seduce the young man. Umar became disgusted by the physical expression of love, but all the same, she soon gave birth to a young daughter. Giving birth to a child messed her up pretty bad. Due to psychic trauma, she found that she could no longer revolt to her faultine form at will, and as a result, began to violently lash out. And of course, she eventually lashed out at her brother. Dormammu won the battle between them due to Umar's weakened state and banished her to a pocket dimension. Dormammu continued his conquest of other dimensions, eventually locating a universe of perfect matter to invade, Earth-616. From here, Dormammu's story continues to be one of an ever-growing obsession to take over Earth-616. I mean... This goes on to the point of being ridiculous. After a while, you have to wonder, why not invade a different Earth within the multiverse? Why not start with a different planet and then expand your reach? Ludicrous. Next on the list of interdimensional beings are the many angled ones. We're told that the many angled ones are cosmic entities that inhabited the spaces between universes. They are memory echoes of the nightmares that plagued the first demons. They are documented as the first beings to ever grow old. All of that sounds really cool, but as of the date of this video, we have yet to be given any explanation as to what all that actually means. Additionally, there are universes and presumably pocket dimensions where entire realities are devoted to the worship of these beings. One known example is the Cancerverse. On Earth-616, Captain Marvel died. In the Cancerverse, the many Angle Ones whispered to Marvel on his deathbed and convinced him to destroy the Avatar of Death and thus ending Death itself within their dimension. 
I love that the biggest crossover to date with these beings deals with the Cancerverse because the long and short of it is, is that these beings pretty much are a multiverse Cancer. They move into a dimension, take over said dimension, and then they start spreading to new dimensions. Along the way, they subvert everything they run across to their will. The big boy of the bunch is Shumagorath. Shumagorath is also known as a member of the Old Ones, and he has been referred to as a Cathonic god, although it's very likely he is older than the Elder God Cathon. Various Old Ones have either ruled or ravaged portions of Earth and the Marvel Universe, but most have only appeared a handful of times and often in a limited capacity with unknown or obtuse origins. Marvel Zombies, the book of angels, demons, and various monstrosities, lists more than a dozen Old Ones. It also appears as though there are various subcategories of the Old Ones, such as Great Old Ones and Ancients, but this too is ambiguous. The sixth dimension is also known as the Realm of Taboro. We caught our first glimpse of the sixth dimension in Strange Tales Volume 1, Issue 129. Many ages ago, on Earth, somewhere in what is now Peru, the evil being Taboro was worshipped. Taboro commanded his people and wielded his power via a wand that created and directed lightning at his command. Although it should be noted that Taboro retains the ability to cast electroplasmic spells without the aid of his wand. One day Taboro and all his people vanished and only the screaming idol remained. This effigy of their leader became a gateway leading to the sixth dimension. Once in the sixth dimension, Taboro set up a rule that he envisioned one day would encompass millions. When visited by Doctor Strange, Taboro claims to be a spirit of decay that arrives to take command when a civilization reaches a point of crisis. In Doctor Strange Volume 2, Issue 54, Taboro claims he wants to rule the Earth. Doctor Strange has a few more run-ins with Taboro, but we don't learn much else about the Sixth Dimension until Vengeance Volume 1, Issue 5. When Miss America visits this realm, we learn that anybody who has visited in the past leaves behind a shade, and we see her interacting with the shades of the three scientists from Strange Tales issue 129. Where is the shade of Doctor Strange, or the Black Knight, whom have both been here? Where were all these shades on Doctor Strange's previous visits? Taboro now stands as a looming giant. The three scientists seem to be at a loss of Taboro's motives other than they appear other-dimensional. We're given no reason why Taboro, who previously was a cunning mage that primarily used lightning, has been turned into a giant one-dimensional character who fights with fire and is made out of stone and seems content to rule over a land of the dead. The only other beings of note here are the Brock Nud, who are some form of demon army. Basically, they're cannon fodder for a couple of fight scenes. Less well known than the sixth dimension is the fifth dimension. In Tales of Suspense, Volume 1, Issue Number 9, published in 1960, Earth 616 was invaded by the Master of Dimensions, Diablo. We're told that the fifth dimension was overcrowded and that Diablo spent centuries looking for a new home for his people. Diablo was immune to three dimensional weapons, even those of an atomic nature. Fortunately, a fast-thinking cowboy was capable of scaring Diablo away by creating smoke with a Zippo lighter and then blowing out the flame. Diablo, a smoke creature, fled, afraid that human beings might be capable of doing the same to him. Next on the list is the Negative Zone. I think I first became aware of the Negative Zone when Captain Marvel first got the Naga Bands and him and Rick Jones had to keep switching places with one another with one of them having to spend their downtime in the negative zone. This is a universe made entirely out of antimatter. This means that anything that goes from our universe to there or vice versa must completely reverse polarity or be instantly annihilated, albeit this rule seems to have been applied in an inconsistent manner and recently seems to have been tossed out the window altogether. Unlike our universe, which is expanding, the negative zone is contracting and heading towards a big crunch. Perhaps this is the reason why time passes much faster in the negative zone than it does on Earth. One minute in the negative zone is equal to approximately five and a half Earth hours, but there are numerous examples of this rule being applied inconsistently. Finally, much of the negative zone is uninhabited. I've 
Read on a couple of wikis that evolution is difficult within the negative zone, but haven't found the source material to back this assertion up. This also seems unclear as Reed Richard postulates that there is every possibility that life evolved in the negative zone, just like it did on Earth. The two biggest names from this dimension that show up in Marvel time and time again are Blastar and Annihilus. Blastar was once the ruler of the planet Bulur in the negative zone and has spent much of his life consolidating power and expanding his rule. Eventually, Blastar ends up working as a lackey for the more dangerous of the two, Annihilus. This character is closely associated with his cosmic control rod, which extends his lifespan. The rod gives the wielder control over cosmic energy, which is different from the power cosmic. We're never given a full explanation as to the power of the rod, but needless to say, many of the stories with Annihilus revolve around him losing and attempting to regain control of the rod. He is most famously known as being the protagonist behind the Annihilation crossover events. His overall goal appears to be ruling both the 616 universe and the Negative Zone. I'll go more into this character at a much later date, but anybody who is interested in reading his origin story should check out Fantastic Four, Volume 1, Issue 140. At the center of the Negative Zone is a giant black hole which is causing the Negative Zone's crunch. If one passes over into the black hole's singularity, one arrives at the crossroads of infinity. This is an area that branches off into an unknown number of universes. One can step off this path at various points, and if one stays on the path till its end, one will arrive at an area the original Beyonder called home for a time after Secret Wars 2 and before combining with the Molecule Man to become a cosmic cube. It should also be noted that each alternate Earth appears to have its own version of the Negative Zone. A couple of quick examples. In Ultimate Marvel, the Negative Zone contains a corrosive atmosphere, and Annihilus exists as the villain Nihil. From Earth 9047, also known as the Humorverse, the Negative Zone is known as the Negatory Zone and is represented as a large labyrinth or maze. Running parallel to our universe are a few other universes that weren't mentioned in my last video. If one grows small enough in size, they may enter the microverse. This universe has classically been reached by shrinking via PIM particles. After reducing to a certain size, one crosses over a nexus and into the microverse. Since that initial explanation, the waters have been considerably muddied as to how one traverses back and forth between this dimension. Interestingly, it appears that the same microverse may run parallel to the universe under several alternate Earths, or perhaps all of them. This was shown when Null the Living Darkness attempted to bring himself and the Overmind back to Earth-616, and he accidentally ended up in Earth-S instead. Within the microverse, we find planets, entire civilizations, etc. It's a really diverse space. I'm not going to go into any more detail on it at this time, as several series such as The Micronauts and Captain Marvel Volumes 4 and 5 have extensive storylines taking place there, and I haven't had a chance to read up on everything that happens. Beneath the microverse, we have yet another plane known as Underspace. This space made its first appearance in The Mighty Avengers Volume 1, Issue Number 26, published in 2009, and has only appeared in a handful of comics to date. This area is initially shown as an infinite void, but by the next issue, Hank Pym has set up the artificial intelligence Jocasta to act as the Infinite Avengers mansion within the space. We're then shown that via various dimensional doors within the mansion, that the Mighty Avengers can have access to various dimensions. I'm uncertain as to how much reach one has within this space, or how and why it should really even exist when we already had the Nexus, as discussed in my previous episode. Alright, now let's take a look at the opposite of the Microverse, the Macroverse. The Macroverse was first seen in Silver Surfer Volume 3, Issue Number 140 published in 1998. The surfer was sent to the macroverse by Coroner after he failed to succumb to Tenebrae's plan to subdue him into a false reality whereby Norrin Rad had never become the Herald of Galactus. Tenebrae was the representative 
or herald of a cosmic mind known as the Mergence. While in the Macroverse, Silver Surfer meets with a being who calls himself Samadhi. This being goes on to explain that the Macroverse is a collection of universes folded within themselves. If I were to put forward a theory to tie this together with what we already know about the multiverse, this would most likely represent the various clusters of realities we find within the multiverse, whereby each cluster exists within a macroverse. Once one has left their individual reality and entered the macroverse, the only way to return is to find the door which marks the termination point of the macroverse, which, under most circumstances, will annihilate anything that enters. It takes the Silver Surfer two tries, but eventually he is triumphant in crossing over the barrier. So, if there is an underspace, as we mentioned a moment ago, it stands to reckon that there is an overspace. The overspace first appeared in Damage Control Volume 3, Issue Number 4, and in several cosmic storylines after that, but as far as I know wasn't named until The Mighty Avengers, Issue Number 30, published in 2009. Much like the underspace, this area can be reached via various methods, including the use of PIM particles. The overspace is an area above all other realities that is most often used to show interactions between various cosmic entities. It's here that we see Hank Pym named the Earth Scientist Supreme by eternity. It's here that the Cosmic Congress discusses matters of importance. It's here that the battle between the First Firmament and Eternity took place. And it's here where we last saw the original Ultimates team leaving reality behind and on the hunt for makers. And that is a great place to end this episode. I think I've covered most of the major other dimensions that have beings interacting with Earth-616. Some topics, such as Earth-S, I've already covered in the past, and for those who might be wondering, yes, I am still going to discuss the Beyonders, but since they come from outside of the multiverse, that will be in a later episode. Furthermore, I'm taking a pass when it comes to discussing Heaven, Hell, and Limbo within the Marvel Universe. The entire topic is a mess when it comes to canon, and outside of Mephisto's occasional schemes, seems to hold no relevance for the greater cosmic picture within Marvel Comics. As always, thanks for watching Cosmic Comics. Feel free to hit any of the buttons below. I'm out.